Would you please welcome heartily Dr. Mark Armitage. Thank you, Carl. And may I just say that your hospitality this week has just been wonderful. I think I put on five pounds. So I'm not going to eat a whole lot at lunch today, but I will enjoy it with you. So. Would you tell me what you did upstairs? Sure, I'd be happy to. Dr. Uh, uh, Baugh has asked me to describe what went on this week. So we installed some very uh, sophisticated microscopes that will be used with the Biosphere project. Uh, one is an actual surgical microscope that is used in a typical hospital operating room. So uh, we had plenty of students. We set that microscope up and got them under that one. We had a polarizing microscope, which you'll learn a little bit about today. And uh, we had a light microscope, a Leica German research microscope installed. So they've got great equipment to uh, investigate these biological tissues as they do their projects in the biosphere. But we trained some wonderful people. We had a great time. I'm very sleepy, so if I fall asleep, uh, would you wake me? Because <laughs> I didn't have any caffeine this morning, and I haven't slept all week. It's been a very busy week, but I'll do my best here. Um, I do want to point out what we have on the table up here, because we want you to come up. So this will get very crowded up here at the end. But we love everybody to come up and handle these bones. The bones that we have here laid out on the table, and David, do you hear us? OK. So we have an adult triceratops uh, vertebra, a juvenile triceratops vertebra, a juvenile piece of triceratops horn, uh, I'm sorry, frill. Now, the frill is what comes off the back of the triceratops, yes? And you'll notice that the juvenile is thinner than the adult. Uh, we also have two rib specimens, one from Triceratops, one from T-Rex. And this very little interesting bone right here, I have a story to tell you. This happened the other day when we were traveling from Washington State to come here. Uh, normally I ship all the bones because they travel better and I just don't like to hand carry them on a plane. But I didn't have time to put this piece of Triceratops horn, uh, which was the first find that we published on, back in uh, 2012, 2013, in Acta Histochemica. And so I, I threw this in my backpack, and of course you have to go through TSA, and you have to give him everything but your firstborn, right? So I gave him the backpack, and of course stood there like everybody with my shoes off, waiting patiently, and waited and waited, and finally a TSA officer uh, waved at me, because I saw my bag had been pulled off to the side. So I got to go around to the large sheet of plastic and talk to him this way because there was only a small hole down here so I could hear him and talk to him. And he walked up to me holding my bag and he said, Sir, are you transporting human remains? <laughs> and I thought to myself, I would love to see the monitor that he just looked at. Because their machine saw this as decaying human remains. Oh. I just find that compelling. Uh, anyway, I do want to correct one little thing here. I've not yet published on the Permian. Uh, everything I've published to date is Cretaceous. And you're going to see Cretaceous today in this presentation. Uh, if you want to see Permian, you should come back this afternoon, because I will blow your socks off. Uh, well, the Permian will. Stuff. Yeah, your other sock will come off. And, uh, while we were setting up this morning, we found this creature. Can you switch back to the table, please, David? This is an interesting creature from the Permian. The Permian period, which you'll learn this afternoon, is a period uh, from 220 to about 300 million years ago. And all the landmass was gathered into one place. This is before we're told the landmass broke up by plate tectonics. And so these critters were living uh, supposedly on this one uh, piece of land before it broke up. But that had to travel. These bones uh, were buried before that split up. So these bones that we're studying, and I think I have some with me today. I'll pull them out here in a minute. Uh, traveled over 8,000 miles to get to where they were collected without 
any damage to them. So I find that interesting also. So come back today and you'll learn about the Permian. Now I have some interesting pointers too. Here's a Triceratops one, but I'm not sure that one's going to be visible in the back. So we, I thought that'd be a great pointer, so we'll use this. All right, David, if you could switch us over to the laptop. So today we're going to present the paper that was published in September in Microscopy Today, which is a publication of the Microscopy Society of America and Cambridge University Press. Uh, that report is a first report. You're only allowed to use that term when you're the first one to present this to science. And so that's what you're going to hear today. You're going to see and hear a scientific presentation as we presented it in the journal and as we will present it when we go to meetings. I want to say a few words about our organization. Uh, the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute has a website, distry.org. Uh, please go there. Uh, we put all our material up on the website. It's all free. Even the books that we publish are free, and you can download them from the website. We did bring copies with us today of old stretchy number one and old stretchy number two. This was Triceratops. This was Nanotyrannus. And uh, you're going to see some Nanotyrannus material uh, this day as well. So we'd like every family to have uh, one copy of each. So come up later and, and uh, get your books. Those are free. We also have all our papers uh, presented on the website. So you can down those, those, download those and present them to your friends. You may have scientific colleagues uh, who might only want to read a scientific paper. And so that's what you would be handing them if you gave them our work. Uh, so uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here for sure. Well, maybe you haven't heard me lecture on bone before. And so I'm not going to repeat a lot of the uh, uh, an anatomical discussion of bone that we've done before. I'll leave that to you for homework. Those videos are on Distry, so you can go on and watch those today. Uh, and uh, so, but I do want to point out a couple of things about bone that are important. Bone is actually soft tissue. Even though it's hard, it's hard because it's crystalline. But the whole assembly is considered soft tissue. And it's full of soft tissue. It has cells. They're called osteocytes, and these tiny little cells not only make the bone, they actually dissolve the bone and remake it. It's called remodeling. Your entire skeleton is pretty much remodeled every 12 to 15 years. So these little bone cells are very busy. Uh, they're dissolving bone and remaking bone. They're called osteocytes. Uh, these are, have been uh, shown readily plentiful in the literature. We ourselves have shown lots of these in the literature. So we have found uh, the bone cells not just in the bone, but we have liberated them from the bone. So we have videos on our website of uh, soft cells that we're pushing on, compressing, and you can see the little philopodia, these little thread feet wiggling around. So all this is soft. It's not yet permineralized. Um, but there's a certain structure in the bone that is circular. Uh, bone makes its, uh, its structure in layers, in lamina. And some of these lamina are circular, and they form canals. And so this is called a vascular canal in the bone. And there's soft tissue in these canals. Inside that canal are your veins, your arteries, and nerves. They travel as a, uh, as a neurological bundle together. By the way, I forgot to do something when I first came up here. I learned this when I was teaching 7th and 8th grade science. The bottom can endure only what the brain can absorb, or is it the opposite? Let's all stand up and find out and wiggle and shake. Doesn't it feel good? Plus, you'll stay awake better. If I'm asleep, you guys can't go to sleep. All right, have a seat. So in these canals, then, are the arteries, the vessels, uh, the veins, and the nerves. They all travel together in here as a triad. Now, researchers have found vessels, and they've displayed them. We have found vessels and displayed them. But we, we reasoned that because these do travel in a triad, we should find the other components. And so we've come to the conclusion that these bones are literally a time capsule of treasures that are just waiting to be uh, uncovered and shown. And that's what you're going to see today, some of these results. 
So if you want more information about bone, uh, look at those videos that are already online. Well, when you come to nerves, nerves are incredibly complex. They have a very intricate uh, construction. They're a woven fiber, but they're woven and woven and woven. There's uh, layers of woven uh, connective tissue associated with nerves. And uh, there are three basic names that we're going to look at today, and they have to do with connective tissue. Nerves are electrical cables that send signals faster than anything we can send. But there are electrical cables that are surrounded in fat. It's an, it's an insulation layer. And so they have a lot of fat in them. And these fat layers are held together by different connective tissues. The outermost one is called epineurium, epi meaning on top of. So it's a neural tissue on top of the entire nerve fiber or bundle. The terms are, are really confusing, too. They haven't really settled well in the literature on the terminology. So it gets really confusing. But you have bundles inside the nerve, bundles of fibers that are called fascicles. So a nerve is a grouping of fascicles that are full of these tiny little electrical fibers surrounded in fat. Are right, you with me so far? Okay. This also has its own blood supply, external and internal. They didn't show the external blood supply here, but blood supply often just rides around the outside of this thing. There's a very interesting relationship between blood vessels and nerves. They, they work together synergistically, and it, apparently they actually tell the bone cells when to do things. They're finding this now in the literature, so it's fascinating, but they have internal uh, veins and arteries, and then, of course, the axons that travel. But all this is covered in fat. There's a cell called a Schwann cell, which is a really thin layer of fat, and it wraps itself all the way around the fiber. Just like you would have a coaxial cable, the outer rubber. You ever opened a coaxial cable? Remember when you have to plug your TV into that cable? That cable, if you take a razor and cut that wire uh, carefully, that rubber, you can peel that back and you'll see a really interesting crosshatch pattern inside. You ever seen that on a cable? It's that metal that's wound. Remember that picture, folks. You're going to see it again. Now, nerves are different, especially nerves in ancient bone. They don't behave like some of the tissues behave. By tissues, I mean the cells, the vessels, the veins. I can stain those with tissue stains that we use routinely in the laboratory. They take up the stains. In fact, in our uh, earlier paper in September, we showed vein valves, which are the little valves inside the vein, because your, 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 uh, your arteries pump the blood away from the heart, right? but they come back through the veins, right? The blood comes back through the veins, but the veins aren't under the same amount of pressure, right? So they have valves to hold the blood in place while it moves up on its way back to the heart, you see? Uh, we've even stained those little valves with RNA stain, and they were positive for RNA. That was in the previous paper in September. But nerves are different. Nerves... <laughs> They're kind of like noble gases. They don't like to interact with any things. In fact, one of the stains that they don't interact with is a natural staining that occurs with uh, sugary tissues over time. Uh, you might picture a piece of toast that you toast before breakfast in the morning, and that brown color that comes on those sugars when you heat it. That happens quick in a toaster. Why? We're putting a lot of heat on it fast. But if you put that toast in the, well, it won't last, but if you put a hard tissue in the ground over 100 years, it'll brown because it's slowly being toasted. All right, you with me? Okay, nerves do not respond to that. In fact, there's a nerve in this picture, but you can't see it. This is a vessel. That's a blood vessel. That's a bone cell. This is some tissue with some bone cells in it. Notice their coloration. They're all brown. They brown up over time. That's called advanced glycation end products. Yeah, I don't like to say it either. <laughs> but this is what they say in the literature 
uh, is responsible for the preservations of these tissues. Can anybody raise your hand if you can see a nerve fiber in this picture? Okay, raise your finger or raise your hand now. These are the fiber optics of tissue. Nerves are the fiber optics of tissue. They react brilliantly to polarized light. And they reveal their secrets when you magnify and study them. And so we use polarized light to study these things. Now, we were convinced, a priori, that nerves were in the bone. We knew they were there because of the structures, other structures we were finding and publishing on. So we wanted a model to compare what we were about to look at in the bone. So we chose the avian or bird model because we're told that dinosaurs are related to birds. And so we thought, what a better model than a bird. So I bought chicken at the store, <laughs> commercially available chicken, brought it home, and I processed uh, a sciatic nerve from it. And so this is a section cut through the sciatic nerve. And I have been soaking this, at this point in the picture, in a very heavy metal stain, a very uh, dangerous stain called osmium tetroxide. And you'll notice that the axons, the, the actual fibers, the electrical fibers in here, are starting to take up that stain. Remember, this is fresh. This is not from the ground. This is from a chicken. So this is the sciatic nerve. Here are the electrical cables in here, the axons. But you see really dark staining out here. See that? That's the blood supply. That's the exterior blood supply. It took up that stain really fast, didn't it? It oxidized it. This is starting to oxidize. But look at the, the epineurium. The epineurium is not stained at all. It's not affected at all. In fact, I left it uh, for days in osmium. And the, the uh, epineurium did not want to respond to anything. So. We have to use these other methods and staining to look at the structure in them. So that's the outermost layer of the nerve, the epineurium, this connective tissue layer. Now if you peel that off, so if you take that outer layer away, you're left with the perineurium. Here is an inner piece of connective tissue that also does not react to the osmium. But look at the axons now. They're getting as dark as those blood supply vessels were on the outside. So, uh, and, and you can now see pretty clearly, these are some of the individual, we call them fascicles. Remember the little bundles inside here? Those are called, fat. these are fascicles now. So you're beginning to see inner structure. So that's the middle layer of connective tissue around a, an avian sciatic nerve. Now I have broken away some of the axons and peeled them away for a little higher magnification and these little axons, are actually, sorry, these are the fascicles within which the axons ride. These fascicles now are going to be our subject of study as we move along. Because, and we're going to show you these in higher magnification as our model to compare them uh, to the dinosaur bones that we're about to look at, right? All right. So I took fresh fascicles out of the, fast, out of the uh, avian nerve and put it in polarized light. And now look at the difference. This is unstained, but it's reacting to the polarized light. And it's giving up its structure. It's a pleated skirt. You see the pleats in it? So these fascicles are arranged together. And what's really interesting is they're not all the same length. They are all different lengths. They terminate at different points. But they reach into each other and they make connection points throughout. And you saw that in one of the diagrams. I can go back to it. But this pleated arrangement is what gives you a very important diagnostic structure. What do I mean by diagnostic? You know you're looking at nerve when you see this feature. That's diagnostic. And the diagnostic feature is the bands of Fontana. This is a fascicle now. So this has maybe a hundred of these inside of it. They're moving in this sinusoidal wave pattern along the fascicle and you can see the W's in here. See the W here? And there are W's in here. So that's an optical effect 
from the fascicles themselves that produce this. But it's a diagnostic effect because you can say, I'm looking at a fascicle, and you know you are. So that's our avian model in the bands of Fontana. Now, if you go back to that original avian uh, nerve that we looked at, and you put light on it from above, and you look at that outer surface, you see a completely different arrangement. You see collagen fibers moving horizontally in 90 degrees to the long axis of the nerve. Remember, this is connective tissue, and there are layers under layers under layers. And you can't stain this stuff, so how do you work out the anatomy? You have to use polarized light. But collagen fibers are arrayed this way, and now you're going to see in a minute how they're arrayed a different way, deeper into the tissue. We went to the literature and we studied the work that has been done long before us. And I was amazed to see that uh, even Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, the father of the, the Dutch textile merchant, have you read about him? Father of microscopy, studied nerves. But even before him, other people have studied them. So nerves have been under intense study for about 350 years. But Professor Glees in 1943 worked out the anatomy of the epineurium and the perineurium using polarized light because you can't really stain now you you can stain this with uh, silver and uh, another couple of metals but generally laboratory stains don't work here is a picture of a nerve that i removed from the bone of that chicken so this is now a very tiny nerve this is about one quarter the width of a human hair so they're, they're very small, but notice the crosshatch pattern here. How did we get that to pop out? Well, we thin sectioned it. We have a machine that cuts sections about 1 100th the diameter of a human hair. So we can cut a very thin section, and using polarized light, we can resolve this structure in here. And look at the crosshatch pattern. Do you see it? So this is fresh nerve from a chicken bone, and it matches the literature so we know our model is good we've got a good model to recognize our structure from bone we understand what bone nerves look like well we went digging as we do to jordan montana actually this fossil came from glendive montana this was our second dig and this is a triceratops condyle now a condyle is a bone that is at the very end of the vertebral column before the skull Remember, a, a triceratops column is horizontal, right? So the condyle is this big software size, so, softball size, I'm sleepy, <laughs> softball size bone that hangs off the end of the vertebral column, and it supports the weight of the largest terrestrial uh, skull known, the triceratops. So this is an important bone. It's under a lot of tension and stress. It supports the whole cranium. So we were very fortunate to collect this, and we decalcified it, which means we put it in a weak acid. The bones act just like normal bones. They dissolve in this weak acid, just like your bone. If you gave a biopsy at the hospital, they would do the same protocol. Soak it in this acid, look at the soft tissues after the bone mineral falls away. And so that's what we did with this bone. What does that look like? Does that look like the avian model? Yeah. We have found nerves in Triceratops, Triceratops condyle. And so we published this uh, last month in March in the journal, as I mentioned. And the diagnostic feature is clear. Now, it's actually even clearer here. Wow. Why is that? Well, because this is lipids or fats, there's a term in forensics called grave wax. These things concrete on themselves over time. They kind of collapse and solidify. And that's one of the reasons why it's kind of hard sometimes to see the structure because of the deformity. But in this case, that cross weave pattern was pulled apart a little bit as it desiccated and, and uh, dried. And so we're actually seeing the connect, the, uh, connective tissue layer, this crosshatch pattern, very clearly. Not only did we find that, 
and we did find many examples of this, uh, we were prompted by this work to then go back and look at over 200 slides that we had previously decalcified uh, from many, six, I think, different individuals, all triceratops. We found nerves throughout all the slides that we had previously prepared. So we now feel that this is common, as common as the blood vessels are. Not only did we find the nerves, but we were stunned to find the actual sheath separate floating in the decalcification solution. So this is now the sheath of connective tissue without the fascicles in it. And so we can really study the rotation, measure all this, study all the structure in it. Uh, it looks really cool in polarized light. Remember I showed you the fascicles, how they move down. And this you can clearly see the wrapping uh, in these. And we found, found many examples of this different wrapping. So we know we're looking at dinosaur wrapping, uh, nerve wrapping. We know we're looking at dinosaur nerves. And we found fascicles, lots and lots of fascicles. Uh, this is a chicken compact bone fascicle. So remember those wavy fascicles that were moving? This is one of them. It's at high magnification. And you can see what in here, class? Bands of Fontana. Yeah? See them? What do you see in the condyle fascicle? Bands of Fontana. Same in the vertebra. This is a vertebra from Triceratops. We have found fascicles in every bone that we have examined for fascicles. And that's like 10 bones, 8 bones so far. By the way, this is our president, Keith Holcomb. Stand up, Keith. Keith is president of Distry. And take a moment to say hi to him when you can today, OK? Thank you. So we believe that uh, this is showing us that there is a ton of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. And so we're very excited about it. The last thing that we did in this paper is we took that nerve and we thin sectioned it, as I mentioned it to you. Like we did with the chicken nerve, we thin sectioned it. But we, we made what are called serial sections. So this is one section right after the other, right after the other. It's hard to do, let me tell you, because these sections are one one hundredth the diameter of a human hair. And a breeze will carry it away. So it's really careful work. But look at what we showed here. You can see the outer connective tissue layers with the grooves in them. Here's the grooves here. And they're showing up in the thin section now. We're seeing a fascicle underneath the connective tissue with the bands of Fontana in it. And the final section shows one vertical band of Fontana left from the fascicle that was sectioned. So we know we found nerves. We know that uh, this is from the condyle. We expect to find it in just about every bone we look at. We were honored in a great, great way for this paper. They gave us the cover of the journal. It is such an honor for us, and we're, we're so thankful. It, we're humbled, really, by this. But they recognize the work, and they're honoring it. We were really surprised last night to see the Microscopy Society of America publishes an annual buyer's guide that goes out to anyone, anywhere, who would use any microscopy equipment. And they put us on the cover of that as well. We have plans to dig this summer in the Permian. And we have plans to dig this summer in the Cretaceous. So we're going to go look for more Triceratops if we can, Nanotyrannus if we can. Uh, when you pick up this copy of Old Stretchy, the dinosaur bone cell, you'll see the blood clots in here that we found. Most of the bones that we have found, and I'm going to give you a little advertisement for today. <laughs> Permian has clots in it. So you got to come back and see that. <laughs> so we show the clots in the, the uh, nanotyrannus as well as in the triceratops. So we're finding it in several individuals. So thank you. We can throw it open for Q&A now. I appreciate your time. Thank you.